just during this whole thing. It's just, yeah, my admiration has gone to the roof. I can't imagine. <laughs> okay, cool. So I think we're live now. Oh, um, fantastic. Great. Yeah, cool. So I'd just like to welcome anyone who's watching this. Thank you so much for joining us as we celebrate International Women's Day with these two very critically acclaimed and very talented directors and producers, Nikki Gogan and Aoife Keller. Um, so if, um, if you guys wouldn't mind, I'm gonna ask you to give a brief introduction of yourself. Maybe, yeah. Iko, would you mind going first? Yeah. Uh, which, oh, but, uh, I'll do go first, Aoife, will I? That's what you're yeah, saying. perfect. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, there's sometimes the sound drops out a tiny bit here. Um, no um, well, yeah, I'm Nikki Gogan and um, I'm a director and a producer and a writer and um, both mostly documentaries and now mostly animation at the moment, but I'm actually just about to start writing a script again with my business partner, Paul Rowley, who I have a company with, Paul Rowley and my Darrington and Carla Helian, and that's still films. And I also work at Piranha Bar, which is an animation studio in Dublin as head of development there. And I'm also, um, creator on one of the shows there which is why I got back into my writing again and we mostly do animation um kids and also uh the show that I'm working on and that we're trying to get off the ground is, is an adult animation show so yeah that's my kind of brief who I am is that enough <laughs> so and I'm Aoife Kelleher I am uh yeah so I'm a director and um, mostly documentaries so I've made um to feature documentaries um, and a number of kind of uh, one-off and series um, for RTE and for Virgin. Um, and yeah, so I, at the moment, I am writing my first feature with Treasure Entertainment. So, um, yeah, which is very exciting and a little terrifying. Um, and yeah, so, yep. Yeah, so I've been I've been working for the last kind of 20 years in the Irish film and television industry. And um, yeah, that's basically it. Great. Thank you so much. Well, from that, we can see that both of you have obviously uh, like gone a, a long way from where you once were and have like made these great things with great companies. Um, so I was wondering, like, what has drawn you to making the type of content you make today? And influenced your work. Uh, do you want to go first, Eve, this time? Yeah, we'll sure. Turn, we'll take turns. Yeah. Be, that was the easiest way to do it. Really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very democratic. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose um, I, I started. I mean, do you know, like a lot of what I've been doing to date. Um, certainly, got it. I got into the documentary kind of um, initially out of a desire to do kind of issue driven sort of work so my first series was called Growing Up Gay and that was for RT and I started work on that in 2008 um, which was hugely influenced by by the work of a friend of mine Michael Barron who was working with um, LGBTQ young people in Dublin at the time he just set up an organization for for young people and um, I thought the work that he was doing was extraordinary the issues that he was dealing with were extraordinary and it, it just you know it felt like he was he was working with young people in crisis in a way that wasn't really being acknowledged and kind of, you know, I suppose 2008 was a very, very different time in Ireland. And, um, you know, there were a lot of issues um, around kind of sexuality, around kind of, you know, uh, gender around, you know, that there, it really felt like um, a society that was actually quite a bit more kind of conservative and um, yeah, like it just, just a, a bit more, um, yeah I, I suppose almost kind of you know catholic as well i suppose then then you know then how things are now you know it does feel like almost you know things have things have transformed really over the last 12 years or so um yeah so the you know uh so that was that was the first series that i worked on um and yeah and it it's it, it sort of started there and then I, you know mostly what i've done is made work that that kind of you know interested and inspired me so whether that was um work that I originated myself or where companies came to me with with an idea um so yeah so when so for example that which would have been the case with um 
One Million Dubliners, which was my first feature documentary um, that that came about because a producer that I knew told me that she had uh, negotiated access to Glasnevin Cemetery and um, and as a North Sider, uh, you know, I'd grown up close to Glasnevin. I lived even closer to Glasnevin now. And um, yeah, so, the, you know, it was just a place that I'd always found really, really inspiring. And uh, so, yeah, so so kind of issues, places, people that I find inspiring, you know, and I just, just love storytelling, really, you know, so I've... Um, I've been working in, I've been kind of branching out into different areas over the last while. I, I made a radio documentary in 2019. Uh, I wrote a book last year. Um, but, you know, and I'm, I'm writing a, a, a drama script now and none of these things really feel like uh, dramatic tr- departures from from my work in the past. You know, I guess it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's really about a passion for storytelling, I think, and, and a, an insatiable desire to know about other people's lives. Um, yeah, we're like answering questions. So yeah, I, weirdly enough, Michael Barron has something to do with my first one, of my first <laughs> project as well. That's so that's a funny coincidence. Yeah, so I yeah I, I I lived in America for a few years after leaving NCD. I did um, sculpture in in NCD in the early nineties, and that was sort of a uh, the only place you could get your hands on a video camera in the college at the time. So. Uh, I found myself up there all the time, but uh, I went to America for years and met Paul Rowley there, actually, who now I run still films with, and we've collaborated ever since. And we did do a bit of work together there. We made a couple of short films, super eight films and stuff. But actually, when I came back to Ireland, I also wanted to really make work that was issue based and stuff after having a kind of done sort of dabbled in the fine art kind of world and had exhibitions and stuff like that and kind of gallery based things. And I actually worked. Uh, on a project called The Loft, which is for homeless children in Dublin City in the Liberties with Michael. And I made a film with the, with the, the clients there who were all kids that were living on the streets at the time. And that kind of um, uh, was one of the first first kind of films I made myself. And then um, myself and Paul uh, made our film CV, which is um, our film uh, based in Mosny um, with all the asylum seekers there. And even at the beginning of that, we didn't even know if it was going to be like a feature film or anything. It was like an art project. We were interviewing people that lived there. We were doing workshops. We were creating work with them, like music videos and short films. We did an, a sound a sound piece with the women that were, that all lived there and stuff. So really kind of a broad sort of project we were working on which ultimately became sea view um yeah and i suppose in a, that that uh, like like yourself Eva, the things i do now aren't a massive departure for that i think there's always a kind of social some sort of social message in the work that we've we've done like i think still films definitely has a an oeuvre if i may be so bold to use that word but you know there's definitely a style to the work that we make whether it be an arts documentary like something like lost in france about the music industry in, in scotland to new york at time the film we made um last year with vivian dick or and then i suppose the work i'm doing now is um because I'm working in an animation studio, there's a kid's side of it, which is kind of slightly different. So that is definitely a departure. But for the adult work that I developed with Gavin Kelly, who's a creative director there, we have very, we actually were in NCD together. So in a way it's kind of come a full circle, but uh, it's still very much about society, about gender politics, about race, about being dis- displaced and disenfranchised. And that's always been a kind of undercurrent theme um, in all the work that I'm attracted to, I suppose. Um, yeah. That's- Thank you. Oh, I think at the moment, yeah, so far anyway. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very interesting that both of you have made work that kind of um, that has been made out of issues that you've seen in society. And especially in your work, Aoife, I think look, looking into your work, I, like it's really evident um, how like the topics that like are presented in your work um, would naturally spark conversations about such things as marriage equality, LGBTQ plus inclusion and nursing care. So I was wondering how, in general, how big of a role do you believe that media has in influencing public opinion? Uh, maybe I could get you to talk about Aoife, then uh, Nikki, if, if you have some opinions on it, I'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like, I, I, I mean, I, I think the media in Ireland, I mean, has extraordinary power really to to um, to kind of create and shape conversations. You know, I mean, I suppose even like last week around illegal adoptions and, you know, like 
the, the primetime investigates. I mean, you know, that the, you have a capacity with documentary, especially, you know, in a country like Ireland where, I mean, broadcasting, um, you know, is still relatively well funded and, you know, and, and the, the as kind of a percentage of population like viewership is still high, you know, you do have that capacity to set the agenda with documentaries. Um, and, you know, I suppose, you know, you, you make um, projects, you make films or, or, or television programs, hoping that you will have a chance to, you know, to contribute to kind of the national discussion. And, you know, you, but, you, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to predict, you know, what will and, and won't kind of capture the public imagination. And, um, you know, for example, I mean, you, you mentioned, um, the documentary that I made with Brendan Courtney there, uh, we need to talk about dad and, you know, that, that ended up, I mean, having, um, much more, uh, you know, a, a much more of an impact than I suppose that certainly I was expecting to, you know, and that, um, you know, Brendan became very involved in kind of, um, in consulting around policy and, you know, like we had the chance to kind of, uh, question, kind of the the fair deal which was kind of the 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 sort of uh established mode for kind of funding um care for the elderly at the time um but yeah i mean look you know like i made a radio documentary in 2019 and you know it went out on a saturday and you know by by sunday we'd had the the minister for justice and the guard the commissioner apologize to a guard who in the 1980s had been kind of castigated with being pregnant and pressurized into giving up her her child for adoption and um, you know that it was a response that you know we really weren't expecting at the time um, and yeah and, and and I think you never know you know um, how things are going to go I mean you, you but but you do always hope that you are going to have um, you know like that 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 your work will contribute to kind of um to the discussion and and you know and will enlighten on the issues that you're you're covering yeah that's yeah. really an interesting perspective thank you and uh, yeah i mean yeah that's i mean you've kind of you've talked talk, it's interesting that i had have had similar experiences with our documentaries like cv is still shown you know i mean direct provision is just inching its way towards being <clears throat> dismantled here you know but they're talking still another few years but anyway there's, there's still like you know it's same people are still living in the same situation that they were living in 2008 when we made the film we made the film in 2006 7 and 8 like so but um, yeah, so obviously, yes, of course, the media influences things. I think we do have, kind of because we're a small island, so there's such a kind of vibrant sort of radio listenership as well. Like, so I think that there is those, what we used to call water cooler moments, you know, like you'd have, you know, for example, the film you made, Brendan, which is just amazing. Um, and, you know, and the national discourse that sparked, was sparked from that is, is, you know, it's really vibrant and really kind of healthy and stuff. And I think that we haven't really lost that, you know, I think that, you know, um, I think the sort of like visual media and like our, our kind of traditional documentaries kind of married with radio, I think is a really interesting kind of dynamic. Like, you know, I'm a, let's tune into Joe Duffy just for a minute, even just to see what, what it is. You know, if I didn't see the whatever watched or see the night before, or whatever, like it's a, you'd always kind of pick up on what's kind of going on in the national discourse. But in a kind of, in an interesting way that what I'm working in now in animation, I think as well, and in some ways, like science fiction kind of fulfills the same role as well, that you can have kind of extraordinary characters really kind of, you know, discuss things and and, and kind of pick at kind of uh, society and, and culture and sort of open up discourse in, a, in an interesting way. Um, you know, I think having kind of characters that are kind of fantastical can really uh, have a, an interesting impact on the kinds of stories that you want to tell as well. And um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it's really it's a really nice medium, I have to say, I'm enjoying working at it. Yeah. Yeah, sea view was quite iconic actually it's funny the the like the visuals of sea view have really stuck with me in relation to the discussion of direct provision and you know like the, the i mean it's it's amazing actually how how documentary can really i mean you know even an example like sea view where yeah. the, the the access was limited but you know how how you conveyed it really can can create a sense of you know the claustrophobia or the inhumanity of a system that that you know might might otherwise not be clear to people at all you yeah know? So it's just you know, oh, thank you no it's, it is it's, it's still the film I'm still really proud of I think that uh yeah 
It was interesting because it was definitely myself and Paul bringing our sort of more coming from visual art background, maybe into the documentary form, I suppose, you know, and obviously people have done this before. It wasn't like we did something that hadn't been done before, but I think for a while, maybe documents have become more reportage style um, kind of thing, like Nick Broomfield sort of stuff is massive, you know, all those kind of um, kind of style, you know, and we kind of maybe were lo- harking back to the sort of 19th to the 70s kind of types of films that we loved. And um, I suppose we were influenced by that, but also we really wanted it to feel like we call it phenomenological like in a way that it, the atmosphere was like you're watching you know a really immersive film film in the cinema like and not, and not a kind of a more disposable news kind of style thing you know so we really wanted to sort of evoke the claustrophobia and the kind of isolation um with the with the visuals as well like so and that we kind of bring that through to all the work I suppose we really try to you know, I that's filmmaking, isn't it? But I suppose at the time, maybe documentaries had gone in a slightly different direction, I suppose, and yeah. we were kind of uh, like embracing the past a little bit in how we approached the visual end of it, yeah. It's really <laughs> nice to hear you talk about how much work you put into Seaview because from, from what I've heard, it, it paid off. And I look at uh, all the awards that it was nominated and, and won. Um, it was amazing, you know, um, a few years ago, I was a part of uh, this youth club that uh, when we found out some, when we found out what direct provision was, we uh, we did a little, little piece on it and we got it out onto the radio, but <laughs> it was a local radio station and how many people are going to listen to that. But that's the great thing. That's the great thing about documentaries that are uh, kind of distributed to a wide audience like like CVU. Uh, they really get the message across and kind of educate a lot of people on uh, things like this. Yeah, no, it is. It's 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 I it's different. It's hard enough because I've ta- kind of in a slightly different way to have worked in making sort of feature docs and then trying to kind of get them on TV. It's a little bit of a more difficult journey, um, as you know yourself, you feel like, but I think you've worked more closely with broadcasters, I think, sort of in getting the ideas, sort of ha- having a place for them to, to live before um, you embark on making them, you know, which is a nice way to do things. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> lots, of, lots of ones that have, haven't actually worked out. Yeah, uh-huh. of, the, there are, of the ones that have actually found a home, it's, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely, yeah, it's a challenge to find a home sometimes for your films, that's for sure. But I, I don't know, yeah. if, if you can't, if, or else give them away for free. I mean, CV is online for free now, has been for years, but at the start we had a sales agent and they were like trying to, you know, um, recoup some funds and stuff like that. But anyway, yeah. Wow. Well, uh, you're certainly, that, that was certainly a project that you were passionate about anyway. Um, and I imagine another thing that you've done in the past that you're passionate about is um is when you founded the daylight film festival uh it was ireland's first digital arts festival and i was just wondering what was your inspiration behind setting that up and what did you really hope to achieve to get out of that um dark light yeah that uh i don't think i (laughs) I didn't know I want to achieve anything I think we just like it's like Ollie and you guys you know I just think I'm so happy you asked me to do this because I just think it's brilliant everybody needs every new generation of film and tv people I'm just gonna say film and tv because it's our screen-based work or whatever because at this at this point it's all very there's so much talent in both areas working across both areas just to kind of do that you know and I think I always wanted to when I was in college I always wanted to have a, a collective and I had all that kind of thing going on you know sort of that was my I kind of came from that early early 90s kind of electronic music kind of rave birth of rave kind of thing and there was a lot of community stuff going on a lot of kind of you know groups of people making you know music and clubs and making a whole scene happen you know so I kind of took that energy into my kind of uh, into my my career I suppose and uh, yeah so we just really wanted to kind of show, we'd seen so much cool stuff around the world on the internet you know and we wanted to and every, you know, people had rubbish bandwidth. We were still on dial-up and stuff like that, practically. You know, so it was just kind of a way to get to show people some work that we loved, and that was kind of how we started it. Myself and my two business partners at the time, we did we did a web design company actually, um, which we'd set up in 1996. But uh, yeah, so that was it really. And, and then and then it, it kind of grew, and it just sort of it was always just so exciting to to see the work, to get all the entries in, just for our own inspiration, you know, and to and to just see what other people were doing around the world, and then obviously meeting the filmmakers. When we eventually kind of got some funding to do it, when things got a bit more, um, whenever buoyant in Ireland in terms of the economy and stuff, we got sponsors and things like that, and then the Arts Council gave us funds and stuff and everything. We could invite filmmakers over, and that became 
such a huge part of it. And then I think at that point, then maybe, so that was 1999 was the first festival and we set up still films in 2006 just to get access. Uh, the funding we eventually got for CV, we needed to set up a company. And so then, yeah, at that point, yeah, it was really, it was really great because we got to, you know, meet people who were, um, international, you know, filmmakers and producers and other festival programmers and distributors and stuff. And it became a really nice way to kind of meet people that um, connected them with the film company as well. Like, so the kind of two things got very kind of blended together in terms of how we kind of, I suppose, got to know people around the world who we still know and work with now, you know. Yeah, so it wasn't, the, yeah, like it wasn't really the original idea. The original idea was, I'm sure like you guys, just purely out of just, this is so deadly and a lot of animation we showed a ton of animation at dark light always it's always been part of a genre that i really love you know and appreciate the expression of it you know so uh, was the digital arts part of the festival kind of films animations and yeah uh, so it was digital arts yeah it was actually i mean at the beginning it was kind of it was all about i suppose new new tools and uh, the kind of I was like I would have always gone about on about the kind of democratization that the internet gave that gave people people to make work in films and art and to to reach an audience where you didn't have to have a gallery attached to your work or or be, be on TV you know and the at the time there was way less channels and stuff like that and I mean it's still really tough to get your work on television so you know I spend a lot of my time going to markets uh, to try and, and do that at the moment with my my job in Pranabar but but like it was a real like just new frontier, you know, the freedom of it. It was before YouTube. So you, none of you know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> you know what I mean, Eva. You probably vaguely remember life was life on the internet was just about. But it, it was really exciting, you know. And then there was like there was technology. There was new digital cameras that were smaller and digital tapes. And you could film for hours. And, you know, it was all that kind of it was a whole like kind of, I suppose, the liberation of, of the moving image into the hands of people in their 20s you know and they didn't have to kind of answer to anybody that was the real excitement around it you know yeah it was a lot more accessible uh for people like well it's as accessible now if not more i mean that's what i'm saying it was the beginning of all the access that you all have now to be able to post your short film stories whatever on on all youtube and instagram yeah. and everything and tiktok is brilliant you know just in terms of a, a platform to express yourself and to get your ideas out there you know yeah definitely. I guess the start of all that yeah yeah I think it's amazing how uh still films kind of came out of that film festival in a way although a few years later but yeah. uh, and then you went on to make Sea View and that was nominated for an IFTA like just ama- amazing things coming out of this one film one uh digital arts festival yeah um, and next thing I want to talk about was how like both of you at different times have uh, made work that have been nominated for IFTAs. Like, <laughs> as a filmmaker who like one day would like to uh, have their work be nominated for IFTAs. Well, like I'm really curious as to what, what was that experience like? And uh, was it one where you kind of took a step back and realized like I made it? Uh, <laughs> um yeah like I mean you know like it's I mean I you know I'm sure you'd agree Nikki that that it's it's you know I mean it's it's not the be and end uh, be all and end all and you know like awards aren't kind of why you get into the work um you know it's it's not why you do the work that you do but at this I mean look at you know it's 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 lovely and um it you know it's it's like a it's a lovely high five for the entire team and it's it it can be a very enjoyable evening and um yeah and uh, absolutely yeah there's there's you know and I mean where where awards can be really fantastic um is where they actually you know help the work to travel so um you know when when one million dollars won best documentary the Galway Film Fla that you know, that gave it additional legs. And it meant that, you know, um, audiences were more likely to go to it. It gave it a, you know, a longer cinema run. It generated interest. And, you know, that I, I think that's, that's where awards can be really wonderful, really, really useful when, when you know, you can get more people to, to see your work and more people talking about it. And, you know, I think that, that for me is, yeah, that, that, I mean, you know, that's what you want. I mean, we were talking earlier about the, the you know, 
to being part of national discourse, being part of the conversation. And um, yeah, like when when awards or when media coverage kind of um, you know come into play around your work, then it it, it can be incredibly helpful as well as validating. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's good. I totally agree. Everything you said there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very validating. Yeah, and it's, it's good fun. Um, I think um, as a producer, I sat, as a director, I sat there, um, you know, and a, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. But, uh, you know, waiting for them to call out the winner and stuff. And I've also been, as a producer, I produced a, a bunch of shorts that have amazingly as well brilliantly been nominated for after two and i really think it's important i think for directors to, to get that opportunity not or, or to have that important but it's great for directors to have that opportunity um and writers you know because it definitely helps them get the next project made from i've made a lot of shorts with a lot of different people you know and i think it does help with the next kind of uh, project, you know, if they can go to Screen Ireland and, and those are funding bodies and say, my last project was one or Romney for NIFT, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely worthwhile. And that's always really exciting when something I've been involved with gets selected. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think it's very humble of you guys to say that, you know, uh, we have been nominated for IFTAs, but it's, it's not the end of the it's not the end of the line like uh for me i i would think that both of you have um have gone so far and um my next point is that like having gone to um your respective colleges ncad and dit among others i was wondering um did your courses uh studying there help you get to where you are today as award-winning filmmakers <laughs> Nikki, you're up. <laughs> uh, did the court? I mean, I didn't study film, but I think what what it what it is. I think um, it's for anyone who's listened or gets to look at this afterwards. Um, is your peers? You know, like you are yourself, Liam, Ollie. You know, the other people that are involved in this. Like your your coup is going to make it work for you guys. You need to like you know help each other, work with each other work for free and your friends stuff you know all that stuff that it doesn't happen without that you know it really doesn't you know the kind of grassroots aspect of filmmaking you don't suddenly walk in and get to make a feature drama and go and win awards you know I mean okay for the odd person it does happen for the most part though the most important thing about going to college is building that network of people who you will work with until you know the end of your career yeah yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, it, you know, um, I mean, in particular, like I, I studied film and broadcasting in um, in DIT and, you know, the people that were in my class have really become like kind of a, an amazing kind of close knit community. They're like, you know, they're there for advice. They're they're still around all the time. There's lots of um, producers, directors, uh, directors of photography, amazing cinematographers and um, you know commissioning editors they're they're you know they're all around there and um, yeah they they've they've played kind of pivotal roles in my career and yeah and they're just they're just fantastic sounding boards as well so um yeah I, I mean I think it was actually yeah it was definitely the the biggest advantage of of the course you know was was kind of the the friends and the support network that's it. And if you do have a friend who wants to be a producer, treat them like it is a special bird and nourish them and help them flourish. Because <laughs> we need more producers in this country, right? <laughs> and nobody wants to do it. <laughs> well, it sounds like networking is the most important part of uh, like a, a film course or film degree to you guys, would you say? Yeah, I mean, you know, like it's definitely. Like, I mean, I the the course was hugely enjoyable. I mean, it was, um, the, you know, there was lots of really interesting critical theory. You know, I got to read Foucault and Derrida, and you know, have lots of deep thoughts for four years, and you know, experiment in a way that I haven't been able to since. You know, I mean, there's there's a huge freedom that 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 comes with, you know, like access to all the equipment and you know you have access to a, a ready-made crew and you know lots of kind of uh, really bright interested group of people you know with whom you get to make um you know some wonderful stuff and some truly 
truly terrible <laughs> <laughs> you get to experiment and you know you you have that freedom to fail and you you can be you know incredibly pretentious and you can you know you can you can talk about your you know your oeuvre when you're 18 and just an absolute dolt and yeah and and you know and and you can like you know you're you're reading all about like whether you know Baudrillard and the society of the spectacle and all this kind of stuff and yeah it's 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 it, you know it's it's career shaping and it's and it's it's a lot of fun and yeah I, I don't regret it for a moment yeah no, that, yeah that's, that's actually really good that you said that about experimenting yeah I mean you just it is really a good time to kind of yeah figure out what kind of storyteller maybe that you want to be or at least set the the wheels in motion you know do you want to work in more experimental way instant documentaries or do you want to be you know whatever like you know Quentin Tarantino or whatever so why he sprang to mind because Mary Kate was just talking about him but you know I mean is that where you want to end up you know um so it's like yeah it's definitely a good place to sort of try and, and uh, experiment as much as you can try out a bunch of stuff for sure yeah sounds good and um um as, as you're saying college is a time for experimenting um and discovering what kind of work you want to make and Aoife, for you, it was obviously, it, you obviously uh, decided that you wanted to make work that uh, got people talking, like uh, arrowfilms.ie <laughs> describes uh, your uh, your work as. Um, so I was just wondering, like we touched uh, a bit on that earlier on, but I was just wondering, why is that? Why, um, why do you want to make work that gets people talking? Um... Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, you, you you start projects because they interest you, you know, or because, uh, you know, it's about a, a person or an issue that, you know, that that is new and exciting and interesting to you. And that, you know, and that, you know, you spend a lot of time on on these projects, you know, it can be a year, two years, three years. And um, I think above all else, you want it to be something that's going to that you're going to consistently find fascinating and compelling that you really want to spend that time exploring you know the issue or the person or the place or whatever the story and um you know that that it's going to be something that gets you jumping out of bed in the morning you know so I guess that's that's you know that's the first thing it has to be like personally intriguing to you you know and then um and then of course as well you know you do hope that that you know you have to get an audience for it and you do want other people to be interested in it you know so um yeah I mean like actually as it happens I think the whole time that I was in uh, that I was out uh, I was in film school um I wanted to work in drama I was completely obsessed with Six Feet Under so it's actually really really not at all surprising that I did actually go on to uh, to make a documentary about a cemetery um but yeah so so yeah so actually the whole the whole time I was in um in DIT I was I was determined that I was going to study or that I was going to you know make drama and you know make features um and and actually as soon as I left I completely changed my mind I wanted to work in documentary so I'm only coming back around to 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 drama and, and kind of script writing now um but yeah yeah I think first and foremost kind of issues and topics and stories that I find compelling and then you know um we're being asked I think more and more when we're talking to broadcasters and funders to think about audiences and you know think about what they're interested in too and um yeah and, and I, I guess um yeah you, you just want to you know get get bums on seats as well you know so if it's um you know if it's if it's if it's new if it's different if it's you know if it's I suppose controversial or you know if it just feels um you know unexplored you know you want to be you want to be different and you want to be novel and you want to do something that that's going to fascinate I guess thank you and uh yeah I think every filmmaker has a bit of that in them that they want to do something new and different that uh, gets people's bones in those cinema chairs um I wouldn't mind being Quentin Tarantino either actually <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do find that uh, whenever I go back to talk to students in film school 90% of them want to be Quentin Tarantino too so you know we all want this to be Quentin, Quentin. <laughs> yeah. we want to be Reese Witherspoon that's what I'm going to be she's yeah she's amazing isn't yeah. she amazing and actually she's she's really um you know it's a role that she's totally created for herself and I think yeah. every avid reader in the world is is like inspired by her and her empire now it's yeah, incredible yeah. 
she's amazing yeah the morning show was terrific i don't forgot to watch it yet yeah no i loved it so good I, yeah cool. yeah yeah and um nikki as well as um like with you as well you discovered what you want to do along the way which was mainly producing but you uh your previous work has like on your previous work you've also directed uh some you've also edited or co-edited some films so i was wondering what specifically makes you decide on on uh, what project you will either produce direct or, or edit yeah well i thought when we kind of started still films it was that it was that kind of collective mentality you know that was what we were doing we all wanted want wanted and wanted to direct and we all wanted to you know kind of support each other's projects so in a way that kind of uh, guided some of that producing direction I certainly didn't leave college and say I want to be a film producer <laughs> I didn't even know what that was I'd say at that point but uh, it, so it was a little bit organic and how we kind of all worked into this film so Maya produced the view and myself and Paul co-directed and co-edited so when me and Paul worked together it's very much a collaboration of directing and writing and editing we're sort of like one brain stuck together you know that's kind of the way we work but I've also uh, I also then produce Paul's films, which are more experimental kind of art projects. Um, they have done really well in festivals, some of them, but often they would be gallery based work. So I would work with him on those, but it's very much his kind of voice, you know, uh, and I would produce them. And then with Maya as well. So I produced Pajama Girls, which she directed. So that was kind of her turn to direct. That's kind of how we started off. And then, um, yeah, then we kind of developed some other show like films with other artists that we were interested in you know other people who are kind of in our kind of you know network and stuff and and um other directors and I ended up producing a bunch of other films then I didn't and direct another film and myself and Paul together um yeah so kind of just it sort of just fell into that role of producing really um and and I just also loved the collaboration of that like I love working with the director uh you know or having an idea with somebody or they come to us with an idea and it's like that you have to fall in love with it because you're going to be with this person for like four or five years probably you know making this this project with them you know for, for the most part from beginning to end so yeah sort of go into that myself and Paula did write along the way scripts a couple of things that haven't been made didn't get produced so we're getting back into that now we're co-writing uh, two scripts at the moment so yeah so I don't know it's all very creative like I kind of love it because of the collaboration so for me that's why I end up kind of editing stuff as well sometimes that I'm producing because sometimes it's just between yourself and the director you know there's you've kind of come up you've kind of been with on this journey of the story for so long together hand in hand and then to invite someone into your kind of weird world that you've been in three years talking about this thing you know and suddenly this other person which is brilliant often like will come in and completely blow it all apart but then sometimes it doesn't always kind of uh come together in that way and we end up editing ourselves or co-editing with the director as well that's just just kind of something that's happened I love editing though I think editing is like kind of like script writing you know you're with documentaries like you're creating the story in the edit you know when you're making a documentary really you're taking all the dialogue you're putting it all together you know you're sort of you know crafting the story out of words and I find script writing in a very similar creative process to editing docs I have to say but I do miss editing I don't really do it at the moment so I feel a bit sad but it's great fun yeah, yeah it, it, <laughs> it's all very organic there's no clear answer to that story <laughs> no I, I found what you said really interesting um especially about the the collective you're talking about and mm. stuff and the dynamic that all of you kind of work on this one project and in, in yeah. uh, have you ever acted in someone's project and uh you would get one step closer to actually becoming Reese Witherspoon then <laughs> <laughs> well myself and um, Paul's first Super 8 film, which we actually showed in Indie Cork, invited us to do a retrospective of all our work. We dug out this Super 8 film that we we made in San Francisco together. We were running around. I was dressed up as Nancy Reagan, but I had a Reagan. It was like in a wig and stuff. <laughs> that was it. There's a few cameos of me, really, uh, uh, reluctant cameos in some of the documentaries where you can hear my voice sometimes because just you needed a question, you know, and it's like we tried to cut around it. But yeah, no, I'm not a, in front of the camera. Although, I spend my life in front of the camera now, of course, this is it. <laughs> Talking on Zoom to people. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm uh, very happy that you agreed to do this. Um, so, uh, th well, this is one of the most important questions for me uh, asking you guys uh, today. 
on International Women's Day is that based on your experiences as female film directors or female filmmakers, um, do you think that there is a barrier for women who want to get into the Irish film scene? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that it is something I've maybe experienced a little bit more in commercials than in anywhere else, really. I think that, that often in commercials there can be um, a, a perception of what a director is and what a director looks like and how a director acts, I think, um, maybe more than in other areas where, I mean, you know, I know um, lots of successful women and lots of brilliant women who are working in in film and television and um, but you know where where I've been speaking to other women directors and where I know that 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 women maybe are struggling a little bit more is in commercials and um you know um more and more like when you ask you know who's directed commercials even commercials around women's day or you know leveling the playing field and all that kind of thing often um even those commercials are directed by men. So it's, it's um, I don't know, I guess there's, there's less transparency maybe with around commercials and, you know, there, there's bigger budgets and people perceive that a safe pair of hands is a male pair of hands. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I don't know, like, I, I mean, I have directed commercials in the past, but it's just, yeah, it's, I, I guess it's the one area where, where I have maybe felt a little bit more, um, hindered I don't know your I'd love to hear your experience Nikki but I mean it, it just it doesn't seem to be as much of an, an issue in a, anywhere else I don't think yeah I think I think we're because we're both coming from documentaries it's a bit of a it's definitely a lot more women like like I've been at markets at pitching for docs like at meat markets and stuff in Sheffield and there's just as many women sitting around the table as there is men and that's just kind of the way it is I don't know why for documentaries maybe to do budgets I think possibly but I think maybe just women maybe feel drawn towards telling certain kinds of stories you know that maybe suit documentary for genre format I don't know could be part of it too um in terms of drama um I haven't really kind of got into that world myself but I have to say um I do, I do, I do know there's, there's problems. So say, for example, for writing. So I work at writers teams on the, on the TV series, the kids stuff. And I definitely found that uh, I needed, I wanted to have gender parity in the writer's room for my go. And it was really important to me. The creator of the show is a man and he's like a 50 year old man. He's very nice. Of course, Alan, he's amazing. But also it's about a little six year old girl and something Mary Kate was saying earlier on. It's like, it's, you know, it's, this women's stories, women, it's like the virtual test whenever they're talking about is there, is there two women in this in the film talking to each other about something that isn't other than a man? You know what I mean? And most films fail that, like, you know, so her 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 point was like so many stories haven't been told yet. So what I wanted to do with my go was to make sure that a, a, a TV series that was about a little girl and her friends was, you know, that at least half the stories have been written by by women, you know. So, so I've had to kind of, and I I kind of like I know people that like wince when they hear quotas, but I do think that it's a good idea, and I think that your generation filmmakers are definitely stepping into a world where that's all kind of the the dirty words been said, and you know people are really like like consciously, you know, um, making uh, women's voices more present on screen, and that's commercial as well as you know. Um, you know, ethical, whatever, uh, you know, because women are more women watch TV and watch films and stuff. I mean, there's, you know, there's a business end to it as well. But yeah, so personally, I haven't really, to be honest, that much, but I haven't really delved into the world of drama myself. But as a producer, I've definitely had to kind of fight my corner to get some of these things over the line um, in terms of just because simply people will be like, why do you want to do that? You know, and it's like, because half the women half the people on the planet are women you know what I mean and it's just even to I mean they're all sick of me now at where I work here and we talking about it now but at the start like they'd be just like really and I'd be like yeah really and they'd be like why do you want to do that I'm like well <laughs> you know because I feel like you know women's voices are just to have a, a, as equal a place as men's do so uh you know um I'll continue to do that and I think though I think the budget thing is interesting because I think there's a women's um funding scheme at Screen Ireland um, um set up a couple of years ago and it wasn't meant to be for, for first-time filmmakers but the budget was really small and stuff and I kind of definitely felt that even though it was a really great idea brilliant just to have a women only kind of or female-led rather uh director writer led uh, projects made but I never understood why there was this 
cap on budget so that it was equal to the sort of what first time filmmakers kind of schemes I had done before. So in a way it was like it went, it was a brilliant step in the right direction, but it didn't go far enough and to go, okay, well, you know, you'll have whatever whatever budget to make your film that you could apply for if you were just going for regular production financing. Anyway, that's probably a bit too much detail. But I just think the stuff like that, I think it's just unconscious. It's the unconscious bias thing really, isn't it? You know, so it's just really trying to make that conscious thing. And I think that as a as a woman who's always been quite tenacious and sort of didn't really ever think I couldn't do stuff, you know, I always just thought I thought if something's cool, I'll try and do it, you know. Um so uh I think that's uh, I'll always push a bit more, I think, for women. <laughs> so if that answers your question, sorry, that was my rant. <laughs> uh, I, I think what you said was amazing um, and mind blowing, especially um, what you said about um, like some of the commercials not being uh, directed by women, like leveling the playing, playing fields. Uh, I've seen that ad a million times and you just, I, I, I don't know, it's, you would, you would assume that it would be directed by a woman, but it wasn't, and maybe that's unfair, maybe it's, it's not, but uh, that's not for me to decide. Aoife, did you have something to, else to say? I was just going to say, maybe it's unfair of me to pick on that ad in particular, but it, you know, I just, I, I've, I've just noticed myself as, as a, as a, you know, as a director of commercials that I tend to get offered yeah ads about tampons or offer asked to pitch for ads about tampons or ads about you know kind of um moms having cups of tea and those kind of things which is you know they're wonderful and really important and actually there's an absolutely amazing I think body form did a series of commercials recently in the UK that are like glorious art they're fabulous <laughs> stories they're amazing you should all check them out but uh, you know so it's not that those um th- those aren't topics that I'm interested in but I just I I note <laughs> that uh, those are almost exclusively the uh the topic wow yeah so, yeah yeah, that is a quite weird, all right. And um, Nick, yeah, I think you were right saying that uh, my generation um, is is less likely to kind of take that unconscious bias because, um, like, you see people um, like a few of my friends who were a part of uh, setting up this film club that I'm a part of in Leak Slip, and for about three years now, we've been mostly, uh, mostly young women. Like uh, yeah. there's, there's mostly 10, there's 10 in the club always. And for a long time, there's been six to four, six uh, young women to four young men. And um, also friends of mine, like Ollie and another one of my friends, Phoebe Moore, who set up her international film festival. Like we are, um, there definitely is uh, uh, the the voice for women definitely is getting bigger. I feel um, yeah. it's I noticeable as well because um, last year or the, two years ago, my film club went to uh, a film festival and there was actually several panels about inclusion for women in uh, film and TV, and they were very kind of they were <laughs> really good yeah. and inspirational talks. So. But don't also make sure that you don't like as somebody who's obviously very aware, like don't women will, you know, we tar- will fall into the organizational, the organizing, the producing. So there's a lot of women producers, like there's no shortage of women producers, but it's really important for young filmmakers like Aoife to get to make sure, you know, that you find your strong producers to work with that are going to kind of work with you and stuff like that. And, to, you know, and yeah, because, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's a, like there's there's definitely the gender roles to kind of slip in as well, you know, um, I think. And that's why we have so many women producers, I think. And we're really good at it. Like we can multitask and, you know, all that kind of stuff so easily. And, you know, <laughs> and it's easy for, uh, yeah, for women to just sort of, you know, which are great roles as well. Like I'm not saying that at all, but, um, but yeah, um, definitely. If you want to write and direct, you know, if you're a young woman, listen to this, like just fight your corner, you know. Definitely, you can even be a great producer, I'd say. Yeah, and and I think it's really important that um, everyone has these kind of opportunities, like today in International Film, International Women's Day, and uh, her International Film Festival, to kind of um, for those occasions to support and encourage women, 
to make their own films, do the, do their own things, and give them confidence in themselves that they can do these yeah. roles, like being a director. I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, actually, uh, last year I was interviewing some casting directors, Amy Rowan um, and Kitty Moylan Shorten, and they were noting that men seem to have more confidence in doing a role that they don't know everything about, while women don't. And um, it's probably down to uh, confidence, but I'm so glad that there are events like this that uh, give women and young women the confidence to do these things. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. It's great. Yeah. So um, let's see what time it is. Yeah, we have a few minutes left. So um, Aoife, uh, you were mentioning in college you were learning about um, some of these talents. For both of you, um, I'm curious as to whether you've came across any female talent in particular that has inspired some of your work in the past. Or over the years? Uh, yeah, so I actually, so my my master's was in women's studies actually in, in Oxford and it was like, um, it was an amazing experience and, um, and actually as it happens I was living in a house full of women at the time and, um, and you know the it, it was kind of, it was, it was a really interesting moment I was kind of debating as to, to you know uh, whether I was going to stay in television or you know go back to academia and and actually I found the year um incredibly inspiring and like um afterwards I was determined that I was going to go back and and um and and work in documentary and trying to tell more women's stories as well um and yeah I mean you know I like I've I've met amazing women at every point in my career, you know, the, the women that I, I was in college with, like there's, there's just an extraordinary group and, and lots of uh, women directors there, um, you know, who are still working and are still just, they're really extraordinary. And actually they're, you know, they're all over the media in different areas. Some of them are producers, some of them are, you know, um, journalists and yeah that they, they're like they inspired me throughout my time in college and women producers and actually I've, I've been you know my um the the commercials agency that that um that represent me there you know it's run by a woman and um, it was a, a, a woman producer who um hired me to direct my first feature uh, women have have played um absolutely vital roles in you know in supporting me in mentoring me um, and yeah, and I suppose, you know, the, the, the story that I tell most recently was a story about a, a really amazing woman, um, Magella Moynihan, who was, um, who was the guard that I mentioned to, who had to give up her, her son for adoption. But yeah, so, you know, telling women's stories, working with women, um, you know, when actually, uh, when we were making the, the documentary with Brendan Courtney, um, we had an all-female crew, which was quite a quite a novel experience, actually, because I, I mean, I remember in the early days of my career, uh, you know, I was often the only woman on the crew. And I, I you know, I think that's changing more and more. And, you know, I think that that young women aren't as, as, as kind of anxious around technology as maybe, you know, as even I would have been at the start. Um, and, you know, I, I've uh, worked with amazing cinematographers, Kate McCullough and Eleanor Bowman, who are just, you know, they're, they're, their work is absolutely, um, you know, it's, they're, they're extraordinary by, by any standards. Um, and, and Kate actually shot normal people and you know like has been Eleanor just uh, won a, a cinematography award in Vancouver you know so they're yeah internationally renowned women um, and you know the 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 yeah so so basically women have been there every step of the way and I definitely wouldn't be where I am without you know the vision of the extraordinary women that I've met. That's incredible. Nikki, do you have any women who have inspired you over the years? In a kind of similar way, yeah. Apart from Reese, obviously. I mean, Reese is like <laughs> top of the list. No, in a similar way, like it's definitely the same. It's always been like my my like in, even in college, like Ailey McKeown was my special, whatever my my tutor and stuff. And then she set up art house, which then became film based. And I, I came back from my America trip there to there to go 
and study there and then end up working there again after that and yeah and, and similarly we like cases you know I've worked at Kate McCullough and like my Darrington my business partner and then in terms of yeah oh there's always been like you know it's kind of funny there's yeah, I've, I've always had great support, um, like Theresa McGrain and Screen Ireland and then Eileen Bell and Enterprise Ireland. I mean, in terms of the big institutions and stuff, like just kind of been there really supporting because I, I obviously I'm doing the making work, but also the, the exhibiting of work as well, you know, and they've always been kind of there um, and uh, uh, kind of behind me, you know, and supporting me for sure. Like, uh, yeah. And then and then for, in terms of filmmaker that I, I really love and I've got to work with, which is a real treat, is Vivian Dick. I'm sure you know her. She's like incredible Irish filmmaker who kind of ran away to New York and she was a teenager and uh, sort of making work um, in the 1970s in the no wave punk scene in New York. And then she came back to Ireland and I met her. I, sh- I got to show her work at Darklight. And her like her film Visibility Moderate is it's it's still my favorite Irish film. Like it's really it's a wonderful if you've never seen it, it's incredible. It's like a time capsule made in 1980, 81 maybe. Yeah, it's just it's one of the most her her kind of her creativity of storytelling. It's so loose and fluid and stuff, and it's kind of a mixture of like um, documentary and drama. But there's no label on anything. It's really it's just yeah, she's incredible. And then I got to make a film with her last year. I think I mentioned before when the Arts Council Real Art films um called new york our time which she went back to new york and met all her friends from the late 1970s and made a film about her time there and yeah so that was a real special thing to, that i've got to do with my career is that kind of uh working with someone who you admire so much you know um and she's she's very cool as well of course yeah um, yeah yeah um so with two minutes ago <laughs> um i'm just um i'd like to ask you for any um, filmmakers watching this, uh, young or any age, uh, what advice would you give to uh, those emerging filmmakers who want their work to one day be as good and as quickly acclaimed as your work? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, it's just to reiterate what you said, or what we've said already, um, you know, like get a network um, and, and you know, tell stories that inspire you, you know, I mean, that's, it, it, it's, it's quite basic in a lot of ways, you know, and then, yeah, I mean, it just, just keep pushing your work and, and like, just, just keep going and, and, you know, try to, um, I mean, it, you know, there are so many options now with, you know, whether it's like, TikTok or you know YouTube or or any of it like you know they're they're all um amazing media for storytelling you know um whether it's you know long form or short form and you know the you know the democratization um has come with huge advantages and there's there's lots of ways to kind of draw attention to your work you know so I guess just take advantage of all of it and um yeah that's about it really that's that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, yeah, exactly. You know, take, look around you. I'm not around you right now. When you're allowed to be out of the pub again and, 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 you know, so these are the people that are going to be your, your peers. You are the next generation, you know, so yeah. Um, yeah. And exactly. Yeah. Tell stories that you you feel you want to tell and you feel passionate about because you, it'll be you, with you for years, you know? So yeah, that's, that's a big one as well, for sure. Great. Um, before we go, is there any places in particular um, emerging filmmakers should distribute their work that you know of or send their work? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I suppose it's like, like what Eve was saying, you know, I mean, it's all there, like it's all at your fingertips, you know, make your YouTube channels, get your work out there, you know, and, and I think, I think still like things that are good will surface you know i think if people are interested in enjoying what you're what you're making they're going to like share it with their friends and stuff like that you know in terms of distribution it's just a bit it's a big question now as well because of um obviously the cinema's been closed and stuff like that so it's it's at a, it's at a kind of a, a crisis point at the minute you know with cinemas but it'll come back you know so yeah i mean festivals of course that's the thing getting your work into festivals Eve was saying earlier on about awards and stuff like that and yeah like you know like the film freeway and that like the last sort of short film that we made myself and paul it was one of his his short more experimental works called the red tree and like you know he just put he put put the 
the grafton you know on film free when he submitted it to loads of lgbtq plus oriented festivals or festivals that had you know more that would show more experimental work it's a little documentary and it's just screened in I don't know, like 50 places or something and won tons of awards you know what I mean so it's just really getting it out there like you'll, somebody will always be interested in what you're doing I'd say you know but it's just kind of yeah uh, the platforms are there it's just sitting down and filling it all in and sending away you know I think that for, for people coming up like you know there's tons of tons of festivals going on apparently festivals have had loads more entries this year than ever before so yeah I've heard this, I've heard tell. Yeah, so people are... It would obviously be less, but... Yeah, it's interesting. I think maybe for the last year, maybe people have been making work that maybe they hadn't had a chance to do before because they had to do a day job. Yeah. The red tree is beautiful, by the way. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> and Stunning. Watch, watching documentaries and, you know, watching the yeah. kind of work that you want to make is just so so useful and so inspiring. And yeah, I mean, I, I guess you. knowing, like, you know, I'd like to do something like that or I'd like to, you know... Yeah. yeah 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 definitely i still find it so inspiring yeah Fantastic. well uh you guys have said so many great points and i'm <laughs> sure that a lot of people like me have come away from today inspired so thank you i want to thank you so much for being here and hopefully we'll get you guys uh in again sometime in the future maybe next international women's day yeah Listen, thanks. So lovely to meet you and thanks a lot. And well done yourself and Ollie. And I don't know if the other people's names are involved, but it's just everybody needs you guys to keep doing this. It's really important that you have people who are willing to kind of, you know, step outside of their own kind of idea and just kind of make a community event, you know, for, for all you guys. It's brilliant. Definitely. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for having me. No it's lovely to see you, Fa. <laughs> yeah, lovely to see you too, Nikki. Bye. See you soon. I think we live quite close to each other. I might drop you a little email. We go for a canal coffee or something. Yeah, I'm in Fibsborough. <laughs> and I'm in Drum Condra. So oh. we just up the road. There you go. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See you. Bye. Yeah.